We are so excited that you are able to join us this evening of the Niagara Region Seat at the Table program, Understanding Different Levels of Government. My name is Grace Eldajani, and I am the chair of the Women in Niagara Council, which is part of the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce. I am assisted by Rochelle Ivry, a Canadian citizenship judge and member of the Niagara Region Women's Advisory Committee, who will be moderating the panel discussion this evening. To start, uh, we are recording tonight's session so that those who were not able to make it can still hear from our great lineup of speakers and panelists. Um, unfortunately, with the webinar set up, we don't have very many capabilities in um, allowing videos and microphones to come on, but if there is a question uh, you would like to ask in the question periods, let us know via the chat and we can um, give you permission to, you know, uh, turn on your camera so it's a little more engaging. Um, to start, um, we have also enabled live transcripts, so you can see closed captioning on your screen. Um, it is not perfect, of course, but it is very close. Um, if you cannot see it, you do have to go to the settings at the bottom of your screen where it says live transcript, and uh, you can, of course, adjust what you see and what you don't see there. Now, to start this evening, we are going to launch a couple of polls. Uh, the first one is for us to get a better understanding of who we, of course, have around the table this evening. It is a set of seven demographic questions, and for each of them, you can choose uh, prefer not to answer if you do prefer not to answer. Uh, I will note that due to Zoom capabilities, there is uh, for the prefer to self-describe option, um, we, you actually can't self-describe. Uh, so it is quite limited there, but, um, and we are asking you to note that the last two questions, it is um, sort of a combo deal. So uh, we just ask you to um, answer as honestly as you can, and we greatly appreciate all your responses. Um, so please complete that poll and I will go ahead and do our land acknowledgement for this evening. As we take a moment today to reflect on the importance of the land on which we gather, our provider and sustainer, we look to understand the history of the land. Niagara Region is situated on treaty lands. These lands are steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hatiwen Daronic and Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The two row wampum is the first known agreement between the First Nations and Europeans and is an important symbol of everlasting equality, peace and friendship. It remains the foundation upon which Canada was built. And we recognize that this mutually respectful relationship between nations is essential for reconciliation today. Many people say that the foundations of democracy are built on the gatherings of the Haudenosaunee and their practices of collaboration between nations. We hope that by encouraging more diverse voices to be heard and rise up in positions of leadership in Niagara, that it can be more reflective of those collaborations from many years ago. There are many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The regional municipality of Niagara stands with all Indigenous peoples, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. I encourage you all to do more to learn about the history and current situation of Indigenous peoples. This will help us better understand our roles and take responsibility towards reconciliation as treaty people, residents and caretakers. We recognize June as both Pride Month and Indigenous Heritage Month, and hope that you will take some time this month to engage with the many online and in-person events celebrating both of these wonderful groups of people that are so important in our country and in our Niagara community. This session is part of a project called Canadian Women in Local Leadership and is funded through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Women and Gender Equality, or WAGE. 
We have partnered with the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce, Women in Niagara, City of St. Catharines, YWCA, Future Black Female, Services for Humanity, Muslim Senior Circle, and Niagara Region Women's Advisory Committee to organize tonight and future sessions. So thank you for your poll responses. That poll is now closed. We can definitely see that we have quite a diverse group of, of individuals here this evening. So I'm actually going to launch a second poll now. Uh, this is one to gather a baseline about your level of knowledge, interest, and confidence on our topic this evening. At the end of tonight's session, we hope that you will have learned more about what it means to be involved in local politics, what kinds of roles you could do, and why it is important for women to be involved, especially women from underrepresented groups. After the presentations by Beverly Bradnam and Cassie Ogunii, there will be time for questions from you to our presenters. So feel free to post any questions or comments through the Q&A option or the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you are using the closed captioning, you may have to toggle between the screens to, to view the chat as well. Um, and we do ask that everyone keep in mind that all questions and chat be considerate and respectful this evening. Rochelle will then introduce our three panelists and moderate a discussion with them, again taking questions from you at the end of some other predetermined questions. I will close the evening with some information about our upcoming sessions. So without further ado, I am so pleased and honored to introduce to you Bev Bradnam and, and Cassie Ogunuyi. Bev has been with the town of Fort Erie since 1994 and has held various positions. Bev received her diploma in public administration with distinction from the University of Western in 2013 and was recognized as a certified municipal manager level three in 2019. As part of the CAO's office, Bev's roles include managing the customer service unit, strategic planning, accessibility, and most recently being involved with the region's DEI initiative. Bev is a lifelong resident of Fort Erie, where she has raised three children and is a grandmother of four. Just a fun fact, Bev chose to join a rock band fresh out of high school and continues to sing on occasion. We may put you on the spot tonight, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Cassie is the Manager of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Indigenous Relations at Niagara Region and serves as one of the staff liaisons of the Women's Advisory Committee. Cassie has worked for the region for six years and prior to that spent a decade working and studying overseas in six countries and on four continents. So I'm sure you have lots of stories to share as well, Cassie. Um, Cassie enjoys gardening, hiking and playing soccer and of course a Canadian favorite, ice hockey. A huge welcome to Bev and Cassie. We are so looking forward to your presentations this evening and thank you for being here. Okay, so let me begin by saying oh, uh, how privileged I am to be able to speak this evening. Uh, what I didn't include in my bio was that I was one of the first cohorts for Leadership Niagara. So when we were talking about women in leadership roles, that was something that was started several years ago. And uh, one of my colleagues that was part of my cross-sectional leadership group is actually a regional counselor today. So it's kind of exciting that I've come around full circle and I'm presenting tonight. So on to my presentation. And as I said, I'm doing this at my desk. So uh, please bear with me in case I have any technical uh, problems. Um, I just wanted to start with a slide, what is the difference between a local municipality and a regional municipality? So depending on its size, its history, a local municipality may be called a city, a town, a township, or a village. They're also referred to in this case as lower tier. So when there's another level of, of municipal government, like a region or a county um, involved in providing services to residents, we're called the lower tier. A county or the regional government is a federation of those local municipalities within those boundaries, and they're referred to as an upper tier. So here's a picture, a slide of just the region of Niagara and the 12 lower tier municipalities that make up the region as a whole. 
and just uh, some discussion about council composition. So all of us, all of the lower tier municipalities are led by um, a mayor and council and the number of the council members varies by size. Some municipalities have a ward system which covers a specific area of the municipality that that council member represents. And um, some are elected at large, which means that they, um, the candidates that are chosen represent the entire municipality. So each lower tier municipality also has a regional council representing its constituents. Sometimes it might just be the mayor, but usually it's a mayor plus one, two, three, depending on the size because they're represented by population base. Uh, the following table that I put in just shows the lower tier council composition uh, for each municipality in Niagara. And then the far right column shows the regional council representation. And I've put in brackets under the mayor and council composition to those that uh, are ward systems and those at large. And I'm sure we'll be sharing the slide deck uh, after if anybody does have any questions. So this is an example of a, a local area municipalities org chart, and I took the town of Fort Erie's. Uh, as you can see from the corporate overview, the CAO, um, sorry, uh, leads the team of municipal employees. The CAO is also council's only employee that provides advice and support to the mayor and council in developing and implementing policy strategy and objectives that address the unique qualities and needs of that municipality. So now I'm going to just briefly describe each of the smaller boxes below that uh, provide service. And then I understand Cassie will be providing some regional information on their service provision. So this first uh, slide shows the office of the CAO and what falls under his purview, uh, because we do have just a new CAO here that actually came from the region. So it's really great for us because we will have that ability um, to kind of pick his brain on what some things we can do with the region and vice versa. We actually met with some regional staff this week on some shared service uh, initiatives. So that was exciting. Um, so we deal with accessibility, which is also um, a role that I play here at the town, corporate strategic planning. Uh, we also house the communications department within the office of the CAO, community health and wellness, which is not typically a municipal service provision, but with physician recruitment and the challenges there, and with the closing of our hospital and uh, it moving to an urgent care center, uh, our council several years ago felt the importance of a community health and wellness um, division as well that looks at physician recruitment and also um, works with the community on healthcare um, policies and practices. Our economic development and tourism office also falls under the CAO. Uh, that used to be uh, an arm's length entity, entity a few years ago, but we did bring that in house to just pre COVID. Um, and that includes business licensing and our short term rentals as well. And employment services also falls under the office of the CAO. And that's the life cycle of employment too, from attraction, retention, uh, performance management, um, long term disability, uh, that whole purview of employment services. Our corporate services department, which is also uh, referred to usually as the finance department, uh, is where our property taxes and water sewer billing takes place. Uh, they're responsible for purchasing insurance risk management, also referred to as insurance claims. The annual budget is also led by the director of corporate services, and they're also responsible for all financial planning and corporate accounting. Um, our legal services division uh, resides also within that department. And we do have just a part-time solicitor right now that we do share with two other smaller municipalities. So that's been a really great shade, shared service that's worked for, for the three smaller municipalities. Uh, infrastructure services is probably the most recognizable service that a lower tier um, does provide. So that includes a lot of our outdoor amenities. Uh, the top picture there is of the town hall front entrance and you can see the beautiful horticulture uh, that our staff do. Uh, our parks, our playgrounds, uh, our arenas and cemeteries, fleet maintenance, splash pads, uh, friendship trail maintenance. Um, we also do um, deal in infrastructure services with our water and sewer uh, distribution. So if a water main breaks in the middle of the night and you have no water, who do you call? Your local municipality, our staff go out, they repair that even if it's the dead of winter. Sometimes you feel very sorry for a lot of those staff that are out there in, in uh, you know, minus, minus 10 degree weather and, and they're working with water and um, 
not very pleasant circumstances sometimes, but they're there to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, your water's working and it's clean. Um, we also uh, will learn from Cassie about the region's role in water and uh, as well, because there is that link between the two. We also deal with drainage and we made this point in our shared services meeting the other day that a drain, a drainage course doesn't just stop at a municipal boundary, it goes throughout municipal boundaries. So that's maybe something that we can look at as well um, on dealing with drainage issues. Uh, we also deal with transit and the region has just recently uh, taken over transit, but we still have our own on demand and specialized transit in town as well, but that uh, will be moving to the region in the next uh, several years, we're transitioning that now. Uh, we deal with street lights, crossing guards, things like that. Our planning and development services team uh, works a lot with their regional counterparts as well. They're responsible for the creation of the town's official plan, secondary plan and neighborhood plan. So that's kind of where, how we develop and where we develop. Um, also a lot of environmental um, issues are dealt with between the region and the local municipality. Uh, the PDS as we call it, planning and development services team is also responsible for all zoning, severances, um, and developments, residential, commercial, and industrial. Our building department is housed within this division as well, and they're responsible for permits and inspections. And we've just had another record-breaking year for building permits. So just as an example, our third quarter in 2021 saw 102 permits issued for new residential units with a value of just over $50 million. And that's just for one quarter. So um, the housing industry is not slowing down at all, um, which is kind of good, but it also changes the landscape of our, our small community. Uh, bylaw enforcement and property standards also uh, is provided through the PDS uh, umbrella and with the onslaught of COVID-19 and short-term rentals that are becoming more and more, uh, the enforcement department has also um, seen growth. So we've gone from a complement of two to now a complement of five with additional enforcement for our beaches uh, during the summer months. Hopefully I'm not speaking too fast. Um, our community services department, so that's where I have a piece, the customer service piece, but we also have the digital services or IT, housed in community services, museum and cultural services, uh, legislative services, so they're the council secretariat, they provide election, uh, they, they run the elections and um, also do our records management, uh, retention and um, marriage licenses, bills, bill payments, inquiries, and creating work orders are all done under the customer service umbrella. Um, the customer service unit has been hailed. It's a one-stop shop, but it has been hailed throughout the region. We've had uh, a lot of the lower municipalities come um, as part of the regional network that I belong to, uh, to look at our best practice model here at the customer service unit. It's a one-stop shop. Uh, they do all of our contact us submissions, all of our complaints they can put into work orders. Um, and it, it's kind of seamless. So the person that answers the phone pretty well takes care of that in, the individual calling um, and then send, sends the work orders or the information out or responds directly to the customer. So uh, my motto here is that uh, we're here for the customer, the customer's not here for us. Our fire and emergency services is very important. We're a volunteer group here. Uh, we do have some admin staff, but um, the volunteers handle fire suppression, prevention and inspection. We also have a public education um, piece under the fire and emergency services. And we're just in the process. A few years ago, we amalgamated two stations into our central headquarters. And we're just in the process of opening up our latest uh, amalgamated station, our stations in Ridgeway and Crystal Beach merged. And that will be open this month. And there'll be a community room in there as well that will be well used. So this slide, I just wanted to put a piece in here for those that um, don't often know where their tax dollars go unless they listen in on our budget presentations. So in 2021, the, the town collected $65.7 million and Fort Erie only re retains 44% of that to cover all of those service provisions that I just mentioned. The Niagara region gets 43% uh, of that is the upper tier and that's to cover things that Cassie will be talking about, but um, this slide shows a few of them. And then 13% goes to the province as the education, education tax portion. So I was also asked to speak that maybe, maybe you don't want to, um, to be a candidate for a local office, but maybe you want to be a volunteer on a border committee, or maybe you're not successful in your run um, for um, 
a council position or a mayor mayoral position. Um, but you know, local boards and committees are just as important. They do provide such a great service for our communities. Um, so this slide shows a breakdown of our boards and committees at the town of Fort Erie. Uh, every municipality offers some kind of um, opportunity for residents to participate in their local government. Uh, some are mandated by legislation. And as you can see, the Accessibility Advisory Committee, our BIAs or business improvement areas, the Committee of Adjustment, the Library Boards, the Niagara Parks Commission, which we also have representation on uh, because we are along the Niagara River, uh, property standards and the uh, NPCA, the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, we also have representation on. So some of the advisory boards, um, they provide advice to council on specific issues. Some are time sensitive, some um, have just continued over the years. Uh, but they're important as well. Right now, uh, our latest, newest one was the Affordable Housing Committee. And our council, as part of their strategic plan, really thought affordable housing uh, was something that we had to look at and really um, try to come up with some solutions uh, to be able to uh, assist our residents with, with the crisis that we're all facing. Community Gaming and Development is also under the advisory board. We do have uh, bingos here. And at one point, we did have uh, OLG uh, money from the slots at the racetracks, but that that went away a few years ago. We also have a community health care services committee that also um, our community health care provider uh, leads that group. Uh, cemetery advisory committee, environmental advisory committee, and a lot of these different committees also um, probably have similar committees at the regional level. I know for the Accessibility Advisory Committee, I am in contact uh, with the Regions Committee, and we also have uh, two of, well, one of our committee members here locally that actually sits on the regional board, and she feeds us back information on what the region's doing for accessibility. So we share a lot of those, those uh, different ideas and uh, best practices as well. Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, the Transit Advisory Committee, too, also um, looks at different traffic um, uh, traffic uh, initiatives as well. So some of the permissive ones, just as an example, is a beautification committee, our communities and bloom committee, and the active transportation committee. The picture at the bottom right here is just one of our volunteer appreciation events. Uh, council thought it was very important to say thank you. And so we've had quite a few, not during COVID, of course, but uh, over the years, we've had uh, great celebrations where we've had keynote speakers come in uh, and talk about the importance of volunteering um, and what that means to the community. And so that was just a picture of one of one of them. So I'm at the end here and in just in closing and as a student of leadership programs uh, and believing in the power of women in local government, I'll just leave you with this message. Whatever role you choose, whether it be to run for council, participate on a local board, the following essence of lead leadership I found many years ago, and uh, it impacts the way I look at the work that I perform for the community. And I have it on the board in front of me and I look at it each day. So I'm just gonna read this for you. A true leader has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. She does not set out to be a leader but becomes one by the quality of her actions and the integrity of her intent. In the end, leaders are much like eagles. They don't flock, you find them one at a time. And so I encourage you to reach new heights, soar like that eagle and have your voice heard. Your community needs you. Thank you. So as Grace said, my name is Cassie Ogani, and I'm gonna to talk to you today in complimenting Bev's presentation, which she did a great job with and talk a bit about what are the Niagara Regions programs and services. So the uh, purpose of my presentation this uh, evening is to outline the services that the region provides and the roles of the regional chair and the councillors. So uh, according to the most recent census, there's more than 480,000 people that call Niagara home. The region provides important essential services from clean water, to roads, waste collection, to public health and planning. They'll provide a bit more details on that as well. The region makes socially, environmentally and economically conscious choices and fosters collaboration with community partners to make Niagara a more prosperous place. As a regional government, Niagara region is composed of 32 council members who represent Niagara's 12 cities, towns and townships, just like the map that Bev had in her presentation. So 
I guess I probably could have just started with this. I'm going to show a, a little video that does a good job of explaining a lot of the different um, aspects of what the region is, uh, what the region does. This is the story of the Regional Municipality of Niagara, or Niagara Region, to its friends. Comprising a land area of nearly 720 square miles, Niagara came into being on January the 1st, 1970. Back in 1970, in order for Niagara Region to become the Niagara Region, we needed to challenge how local government was run. To speak on this very special topic. Out was the old county system established in the 1850s, and in was a new form of regional government where 12 unique municipalities all agreed to work together to be an innovative and cost-effective one-stop shop for all of Niagara. And at the inaugural meeting of council, the Honorable Darcy McHugh announced, Regional government in Niagara is the sum of our hopes and mission, needs, and our search for human dignity. Good municipal government is people. What you will be building will be for the benefit of future generations. And that hasn't changed. I'm delighted with that. More than half a century on, Niagara Region continues to build on the founding vision of a government that is open, responsive, and respects the rights, differences, and dignity of all people. Whether you know it or not, the Niagara Region is always working for you. We're here for you if you turn on a tap or flush a toilet. We're here for you when you need to get around Niagara, whether that's on a regional road or a regional bus. We are constantly working and listening to enable our citizens to live fulfilling lives. You bring your garbage, recycling, and organics to the curb, and we take it away, all the while encouraging habits that will make for a greener Niagara. Niagara Region maintains the regional roads and bridges. That means the lights, snow removal, and road signs. Niagara Region runs regional buses that go on those roads, and the ambulances that race to help those in need. We are the Niagara Regional Police, keeping order and keeping our cities safe. We are public health. In 2020, gripped by a global pandemic, Niagara Region Public Health put everything into meeting this challenge head on. Niagara Region pivoted during the crisis to make sure the services people rely on continued. Every day, we strive to live out our core values. We help those in our community going through a tough season, whether that's at one of our many shelters, finding affordable housing, or supporting them to get back on their feet. We run seniors' homes, allowing the wiser of our community to enjoy a quality of life they deserve. We run childcare centers so kids can grow while allowing families to reach their career goals. The Niagara Region is always striving to attract new businesses and support those who already know that Niagara is an incredible place to do business. Our region is a place with history. It serves us well, and we all have a responsibility to sustain it. We market Niagara to the world and make sure our businesses have what they need to succeed. The region takes steps to protect what makes Niagara awesome while planning for the future, where diverse municipalities work together to be more than just the sum of their parts. We may not agree all the time, but we agree that there is a greatness here in Niagara. We share the best known address in the world. The Niagara region always returns to the founding principle. Good municipal government is people. And our people wake up every morning and think, how can we serve you today and tomorrow? Bottom line, we are here for you, Niagara. All right. So some of the departments, the, they were described in that video um, that are part of the region is the office of the chief administrative officer. And part of that includes a regional clerk, economic development, human resources, and the division that I'm part of, which is corporate strategy and innovation. We have community services, which is uh, what we saw in the video in terms of children's services, homelessness services and community engagement, housing services, senior services and social assistance and economic opportunities. In corporate services, they provide a range of services to support regional departments, including business licensing and enforcement, construction, energy and facilities management, financial management and planning, IT solutions, legal and court services, and procurement and strategic acquisitions. Planning and development services oversees planning initiatives to support effective and responsible growth and development including development applications and analysis, land use planning, infrastructure and development engineering, emergence uh, and urban design and landscape architecture. Public health and emergency services delivers a range of health and safety programs, including immunization and other clinics, disease and injury prevention, 
inspections of restaurants and other businesses, sexual health, family health, emergency medical services, and regional emergency planning. Public Works delivers important services, including the production of clean drinking water, treatment of wastewater, maintaining regional roads and bridges, waste and recycling collection, operating landfill sites, and now the amalgamated regional transit. There's two associated boards and commissions. Previously there was three, but Niagara Regional Housing uh, has become one of the uh, community services divisions. So we have uh, the Niagara Regional Police Service, which is dedicated to serving and protecting residents and visitors within the regional municipality of Niagara. In partnership with the community, they provide quality policing services with integrity, diligence, and sensitivity. And the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority is a community-based natural resource management agency that protects, enhances, and sustains healthy watersheds. The NPCA is one of 36 conservation authorities in the province of Ontario and manages 41 conservation areas within the Niagara Peninsula watershed held in public trust for recreation, heritage, preservation, conservation, and education. There's four standing committees. So part of council as a whole is that they set policies, directions, and budgets to ensure long-term success and a high standard of living for the residents of Niagara. Regional council meetings are held once a month. And then there's four Niagara Region Standing Committees, which also meet monthly to review matters within their particular mandate in order to make recommendations to, uh, to be considered by regional council. These committees week, meet the week prior to regional council meeting. All council and committee meetings are live streamed and recorded. So the four standing committees are the Corporate Services Committee, which oversees corporate administration, financial management and planning, IT solutions, legal services, properties management, human resources, and the Planning and Economic Development Committee oversees planning, development, as in its name, land use planning, infrastructure development, and engineering, uh, as well as economic development which includes business development and expedited services, trade investment, economic development to support local area municipalities. The Public Health and Social Services Committee uh, oversees all of the different aspects that are uh, the services provided by both of those departments. Uh, Public Works then also uh, is responsible for all of the different aspects of the public works department that I talked about before. So water, wastewater, transportation, and waste management. There are 22 advisory committees at the region. Um, so this, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of them in terms of for the sake of time, um, but some of them as uh, Bev had said in the city of Fort, in the town of Fort um, Erie, some of them are limited time advisory committees, and some of them have uh, kind of our, our permanent committees. So the Accessibility Advisory Committee, for example, is a permanent ongoing committee, whereas the CAO Recruitment Committee is obviously only uh, needed to be used when they're, we're doing CAO recruitment. And here are some more advisory committees. So we see here, for instance, the Women's Advisory Committee, which we have had a huge amount of support for uh, this project at the seat of the table. In terms of the roles of the different members that work at the region, so the chair uh, is defined by the Municipal Act, uh, and their responsibilities are to hold dual roles as the head of the council and the chief executive ex officer of the region. As the CEO of the region, the chair provides leadership to regional council, Specifically, the regional chair presides over council meetings so that the business can be carried out efficiently and effectively. They provide information and recommendations to regional council with respect to the role of regional council and re represent the region at official functions. Additionally, as the chief executive officer, the regional chair upholds and promotes the purposes of the region and fosters public interest and involvement in the region and its activities. The regional chair acts as the region's representative within and outside the municipality to other regional chairs, municipalities, and provincial and federal governments. The regional chair promotes the region at local, national, and international levels 
and participates in activities that enhance the economic, social, and environmental well being of the Niagara region. The regional chair is expected to leverage social media as an alternative method of sharing content related to the regional chair and their role as head of regional council. And they're expected to govern themselves professionally according to the existing social media terms. The role of the council and the council members is to represent the public and consider the well being and interests of the municipality, to develop and evaluate the policies and programs of the municipality, determine which services the municipality provides, ensure that administrative and controllership policies, practices, and procedures are in place to implement the decisions of council, ensure the accountability and transparency of the operations of the municipality maintain the financial integrity of the municipality and carry out the duties of council under the municipal act or any other act. Council is governed in accordance with the council code of conduct. This outlines the responsibilities and procedures to be followed and supports an excellent track record of ethical conduct and high integrity. All members of council shall observe the highest standard of ethical conduct. A high standard of ethical conduct includes acting honestly, independently, and impartially with discretion and with, uh, with regard to self-interest, avoiding any situation liable to give rise to a conflict of interest, being mindful of the importance of their duties and responsibilities, taking into account the public character of their function, conducting themselves in a way that maintains and promotes the public's trust in regional municipality of Niagara, and serving their constituents in a conscientious and diligent manner. And if there are ever any uh, complaints in regards to the council code of conduct and how someone is behaving or what they've said or written, uh, a complaint can be submitted for any behavior or activity that violates the code of conduct. And this can be an informal or formal complaint that can be submitted. And there's details of that on the website. So that's it for my presentation. If you do have any questions, you can send me an email. Uh, at cassandra.ogany at niagaregion.ca, or we have an easier to remember one at diversity at niagaregion.ca. I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm going to be handing this over to Rochelle. Thank you so much, Cassie. And thank you both for your wonderful and informative presentations. Um, so uh, I know that, so we are a little pressed for time, but there was a question about how you can actually apply for a board or committee. And I thought if we could quickly just answer that for, um, let me just see who had asked that question. Oh, it was already answered. Okay, thank you, Beverly, for answering yeah. that question. Yeah, and hopefully I answered it all right for Sarah. <laughs> But it is just for the benefit of everyone else. At the beginning of each term of council, the boards and committees are advertised by each local municipality. There's terms of reference that we actually keep on our website all the time and the composition of each. Uh, and so you just apply. There's an application process and that's submitted to council. Uh, I did put a note there that some committees do have specific eligibility criteria. So I believe it's like the property standards one. You do need some kind of uh, background um, and that's laid out in the terms of reference. Uh, you do have to be a, a resident of the municipality as well. And then that goes to council. And I think it's done in kind of like a closed session. So it's not just like they're picking your name out of a hat. They actually, you know, review the applications and, and they will look at some of your background um, to make sure that it fits with, with the committee sometimes, but most times not. If you're interested in being a volunteer, we just appreciate it so much that you want to give back to your community. And even if you don't maybe fit to this committee, you know, maybe they can work with you to, to look at another committee that you might be able to um, to work on. So, um, yeah, and then you just serve for the full term of council usually. And there's the chair and vice chair role in most of our committees as well. Thank you so much for answering that question so thoroughly. Um, as someone who sat on the Niagara on the Lake Public Library Board and currently sitting on the uh, Women's Advisory Committee, I can attest that that is wholly accurate. Thank you. <laughs> now uh, it is time for our panel. And um, I thought that I would introduce actually our two panelists today, um, the two Sandras, the first being Sandra Easton and husband Tony, along with son David, daughter-in-law Kathy, and two grandchildren, our lifelong residents 
residents of Lincoln. She was elected mayor of, uh, sorry, in 2014 as only the second woman to represent Lincoln at Regional Council. She has given more than 30 years of dedicated service to her community, including six years as an alderman for the town of Lincoln. The town of Lincoln is working towards realizing its vision as a place to grow, a place to prosper, and a place to belong. Sandra has had an extensive career in nursing and nursing administration, which includes experience as assistant clinical professor at the McMaster Faculty of Health Sciences and clinical lecturer at Mohawk College. In addition to her accomplishments in the field of nursing, she also holds her master's degree in public administration from Queen's University. Welcome, Sandra. Our second Sandra of the night is Sandra O'Connor, and she's currently a council member for the town of Niagara-on-the-Lake, which is where I live. Uh, she was the federal candidate for the Green Party in Niagara Falls in 2019. Sandra has been engaged with her community throughout her life. She has served on boards of community associations, including being president on municipal committees, on school committees, and on professional association boards. She believes in giving back to her community and being engaged with her community. Sandra is a graduate of Brock University. University. She has worked in management for scientific organizations in the government, university, and the nonprofit sectors. She also ran her own geomatics consulting company, so she knows what it's like to develop, grow, and maintain a business. She has worked across the country, but has now settled in Niagara, where she was raised. So welcome, Sandra. Thank you both so much for being with us. I'll just switch this to gallery view. All right. Now, um, the Seat at the Table program is an Niagara Region initiative that aims to bring attention to the low representation of women and especially underrepresented women and women or women of color in municipal governance. And so I have a number of questions for you this evening. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to our discussion. Now, um, the first question, based on the information that we have just heard about the different roles that you could run for, what was your inspiration to choose to serve in your current capacity? We'll start with Sandra O'Connor and then we'll go with Mayor Easton. Uh, thank you, can you hear me okay? Absolutely, yes. Okay, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just uh, further expand on the committees, the advisory committees for council councils or for your town, uh, sometimes people leave in midterm, so there may be some opportunities in midterm, so keep your eyes open. And secondly, um, in Niagara and the Lake, uh, we found that there was an underrepresentation of women on our committees, and we did pass uh, a motion that as part of the criteria for selection for um, our advisory committees that um, gender uh, diversity uh, uh, of gender be taken into consideration in the appointments. So I just wanted to further expand on that. So thank you very much. Um, now back to your question, uh, Rochelle. <laughs> um, as I s stated, I've always wanted to give back to my community and, and um, it's at various stages of my life, I was involved in different things because we all know we have different commitments. And so we have to make sure that it is attuned to what we feel we can do time. One of the problems was that I had lack of confidence to feel that I could represent uh, the people, that I could do the job. And my advice to, pe to women would be, you, you can do it, go for it. Um, you, I have observed women in all kinds of uh, committee capacities and I've found that they are on par in or, or more excellent than, than, than other members. So don't hesitate because you have a lack of confidence. When I uh, moved back to the Niagara region, what my goal was to be on council because I felt that I had the time, the skills, the knowledge to give back in that capacity to me, which was a large commitment of time. It took me uh, two runs at, uh, for council and one at the federal level, but I finally got in uh, because someone else resigned and I was next on the list in the number of votes. So don't give up uh, is what I'm saying. Um, I've always also been interested in the environment uh, throughout my life. And uh, so I am, I like to bring that lens to, to council uh, and um, wanted to uh, represent the environment there. And 
So um, I would have to say that is why um, I am interested in the, in the role that I'm doing today. I hope that's helpful. It has been helpful, thank you. You've spoken to some uh, themes that we hear a lot about imposter syndrome and feeling like uh, you know you may not be made to feel that you belong. Uh, you also spoke to time, skills, and knowledge. So that's something that our participants have to think about, uh, but don't think that you don't have the knowledge because you very much do. Um, and also that perseverance is a really important uh, Thing to consider. Uh, Mayor Easton, how about for you? What inspired you to choose to serve in your current capacity? Well, um, I just wanted to go back to 1983. Sure. <laughs> because that's, um, I was working full time. I was the, um, I was in charge of the emergency department at um, McMaster Medical Center. And I can't tell you what really motivated me, except that I wanted I had concerns about uh, the community not growing at all. It just seemed to be really not going anywhere. And as a nurse, I was quite concerned about um, the uh, determinants of health. This was a new lingo that was being talked about. Um, I was studying to be a nurse practitioner at the time, uh, which came in handy when I was in the emergency department and there was a trauma case that came in and I would go and look after everybody that had the minor problems until the uh, physician came around to to uh, to look after things. So I was um, I was very, very concerned about uh, lack of services in the community. Uh, Beamsville, uh, this was before amalgamation um, really took hold. It was still very, very rural. And so I can't say, you know, you hear about people saying, oh, there were 20 people that wanted me to run. I don't know any of those people. I think people actually recognized that they had something to offer. They wanted to give back, as, as Sandra O'Connor said. Um, they want to give back. And I think that I felt that as well. But I want to say that nurses, because of their public service, um, as well as other professions where you really are focused on public service, like teachers and, and others, we make very, very good can, uh, candidates. And our uh, empathetic skills and, um, and knowledge of, of empathy and how it impacts people are very important qualities. And I certainly wouldn't underestimate um, any of them. Um, so that was, uh, I was there for six years. But when I was on council for those six years, I sat on the hospital board, I chaired the fire and public safety committee, I, put, I chaired planning, I chair, or I sat on the library board, um, and I was, um, I chaired a building project for the senior center, which was a really interesting um, experience. And so sometimes that diversity of experience, that mix of experience is something that is extremely important. So for two terms, I did that. I loved every minute of it. In fact, I loved policy, public policy so much that in 1988, I went off to Queens to do my master's of public administration. I would encourage anybody who's at a point in their life where they could do something like that. And I'm sure that Bev probably felt very similarly. The the, what you learn in that program, you use every day. It doesn't matter what you're doing, that is just so valuable to you. So I completed my degree in 1990 and I finished my career in the mid 2000s. And then I just remained active in the community, a bit of a pain in the neck when it came to land use planning and actually learning about, you know, some of the dilemma, dilemmas and barriers around planning. And then finally, when the inspiration really hit me was in 2014. And I heard this woman in her 80s who had been a member of our community, served on council, make this comment. Well, she said in this very, very, very small voice, it just about killed me. Well, she said, if that's all they're going to give us, if that's all council can do, I guess it's better than nothing. And I thought my head was going to explode. And I thought, you know what? I can do better than this. And so I, I decided that I would run again. I ran against four men. Two of them had, were current members of council. And I want to speak briefly about name recognition. My maiden name is Romagnoli. My married name is Easton. 
My family had been here since 1919 from Italy. My husband's family had Eastern Motors on Victoria Avenue. Don't ever think that everybody wasn't buying cars for my brother-in-law. And don't underestimate the power of name recognition. Don't underestimate the power of a strong integrity. Being a good person and coming into an environment that is politically driven is a core value that you never want to underestimate. And I really encourage people to look at what other people may call as soft skills, what I consider to be the most important skills that you can come in with. Because you can have a very good education. I have been very privileged to have the education that I had. You can also be a person that has just an unbelievable experience with technical skills. Each of us brings important, important um, driven skills to uh, the political environment. And, um, and so I, I don't think that anyone should be discouraged if they don't even have a bachelor's degree. Just look at the qualities that you have and determine yourself where you feel you can contribute. If you can find like-minded people in your community that share your concerns, that's where you start and you get those conversations going and, and you move on. So um, I think the second term that I ran, I had a different idea about change, uh, which I think is really valuable. Um, you know, building a community is really what my campaign is always about. Um, you know, all the important work that we do around designing transportation networks, um, alternative energy is so important, natural spaces, incredibly in sport, uh, important, how we're growing food, how we're building homes, all of these things become crystal clear to you once you're in there, you start to measure and balance um, one uh, priority against another. So I, I hope that um, I'm not scaring the daylights out of people. It's a lot of work. Don't kid yourself. There's a lot of time involved. But really, you have so much to offer, and we just can't do without you. So I want I know there's some people on this call that have already um, signed on the dotted line, and I really applaud them because um, it's going to be a very important race this time around. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what I'm hearing, get involved and get to know people in your community. And don't forget that we have transferable skills. Uh, you may not necessarily have what people call credentials or what have you, but you may have and, and look at those transferable skills and what they can bring to the table, including those skills like integrity and empathy uh, and having a reputation of treating people well. So thank you for those comments. So my second question, so Bev and Cassie explained some of the general responsibilities for each of your roles, but how would you describe your main responsibilities in your current role? What does your average day look like? Um, and I guess I'll start with uh, Sandra O'Connor again. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, something Mayor uh, uh, Easton um, said to twigged my mind and I, I perhaps should have mentioned that before I did run for council, I did sit on advisory committees and, and maybe they weren't the ones that I really originally wanted, but the opportunity came open like the parking committee. And then I was able to serve on a regional committee, Smarter Niagara, which is no longer there. So those are very important sort of um, areas where you can get your feet before you jump into to the, to the council. Anyway, uh, as you said, Bev and Cassie outlines um, some of the duties of the lower tier and upper tier, what, that, what it is that they do. And of course, the Municipal Act itself lists seven, seven different um, uh, things uh, that are involved in the role of, of a counselor, but I, I won't go into that, that dry detail. But um, to, to fulfill all of, of these objectives, um, I've sort of... Um, placed it in three different categories. One is something I call prepare. You have to read the material. If necessary, do more neat research. If there are holes or you don't understand it, you have to analyze and evaluate the issues that are coming forward. You have to make an informed decision. In other words, you have to apply critical thinking uh, to this. And I know that there's this phrase out there, um, 
uh, don't bring facts to a feelings issue. But I'm sorry, I'm a fact person. So I always like to get my facts uh, in there. So I think that that is very important. The next one category I've listed is listening. You have to listen to a variety of opinions of residences and you have to embrace the diversity of opinions because I believe that that will lead to a better decision-making if you understand uh, um, the, the various facets and aspects around, a, around a, uh, a, an issue. So active listening to your residents. And in our case, we don't have a ward system. Everything's at, at large. So we also have to make sure that we listen to all the various parts of our municipalities and make sure that they are all being heard and that they don't feel neglected. And then thinking. I, thinking critically and long term, especially when it comes to our vision for our community and our financial stability. Uh, those are um, things that I think are, are critical when we are fulfilling the specifics of the roles of a counselor. Now, an average day, it, it's going to vary. It, it, it varies with uh, what meetings you have that week because there are council meetings, committee of the whole, uh, there are advisory committee meetings um, that, that you may be on. In, in my case, I'm on agriculture, uh, the budget, environment, wellness, and, and music Niagara. And it's going to vary uh, uh, with each uh, councillor and with, with each municipality as to how that is managed. So there's a lot of going to the meetings, preparing for the meetings, representing council at the advisory committee or the other board meetings. And um, in, in addition to that, um, you have to answer your emails. You have to answer telephone calls because you have to be able to let the know, let your residents know that you are there to listen to them, to, to listen to their issues and to try and do something about it. So there's a lot of, also discussion with the uh, town staff as to what can be done on these various issues or what the status of, of the issues are. Um, so I, I think I've talked enough on that one. I'm sure Mayor Easton has a lot more to say uh, given her experience uh, uh, as mayor and on council. So thank you. Thank you. That was very, very informative. Thank you, Mayor Easton. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor O'Connor. That I don't want to. I'm not going to say uh, repeat anything at all because that's a very, very, uh, very good description of what the what it's all about. So mayors sit um, as the heads of their local councils, and they also sit as um, uh, regional councillors. And it can take you um, ten to twelve hours to prepare for your committees, depending on what committees you sit on. At the region, I sit on the um, Agricultural um, Planning Committee, APAC it's called. Um, I also chaired the Housing Committee when the decision was made to um, do away with the um, Housing Advisory Committee and move the housing um, portfolio into um, uh, community services. Um, I also sit on corporate services and also planning, both areas that have um, significant uh, related issues to uh, the town of Lincoln. So I would say that a typical day starts uh, quite early, um, up about um, six or so, and then just trying to get your head focused on what the agenda looks like for the day. And you don't normally finish until around 10 at night. Um, and a lot of that time is because you're having to deal with the social media and uh, people do expect you to interact with them. Um, the uh, town of Lincoln has committee of the whole. So when we meet together, we have all of our statutory committees meeting on one night, and then the council meeting meets uh, two weeks later. And uh, so I, I think that it does condense the work. Uh, we have some late meetings, but it isn't too bad. Uh, really, I, I think this is a better method than having a single committees meeting on single nights. It, it really, you feel like you're in meetings all the time. A day it can be anything under the sun. And I think one of the skills that I learned when I was, when I was in healthcare was the whole idea of dealing with different groups of people on totally different portfolios, one right after the other. 
And that's that's essentially what you're you're doing um, as a mayor. You have um, meetings where you're you may be meeting with someone about a complaint. You may be talking to them on the phone. You may be interacting with them on the phone and social media, and then finally in person. You have official business that you have to conduct that um, requires you to meet with the CAO or other members of the um, senior management team. Sometimes you have swearing in uh, for different organizations where they want, they're bringing in a new executive and they want you to swear it in, swear them in. Um, and there are local associations that sometimes uh, you, they want to come and talk to you. Sometimes they will come as a delegation. Other times they want you to come and share their meetings so that they can explain to you what they're doing. They may have an ask and you have to be prepared to discuss all these issues because you're not necessarily advised in advance about every element of the, how this discussion is going, uh, going to go. It's, um, I would say that if you're uncomfortable with dealing with things on the fly sometimes, this is probably not a good role for you. Um, and people do expect the mayor to be accessible. So you can't say, well, I've done my 20 meetings a week and, and I'm tired. You can just forget about that. And, and really, it's very, very important that you feel enthusiastic about the job. And quite often when you have your own agenda, particularly if you want to do a specific work for you, uh, which we have some significant um, programs in Lincoln around that. If you're particularly interested in economic development as I am, we, have, um, we are as part of our official plan, the Center of Excellence for Agriculture. So I'm extremely interested in what's happening with every sector uh, within the agricultural community and I spend uh, quite a bit of time in that area. So I think it's it's really what I the point I want to get across is that it's as diverse as your community is and you really have to be prepared to respond um, at a moment's notice quite often on any of, on any of the issues, whatever the order of the day is. Thank you both so much. I think that you have given us some invaluable insights into uh, the responsibility um, and also in, in relation to what would be expected in the role. So thank you. Um, I have a question about your relationships um, that you maintain with your counterparts who might serve in the same geographical area or constituency, for instance, the MPP or the for your particular area or region. Can you explain the importance of these relationships and how you maintain the relationships? I guess, why don't we start with you, Mayor Easton, and then we'll go to Sandra. <laughs> well, it's, it's vital. It's absolutely vital. Unless you, your plan is to become very insular, which is certainly not what my plan was, and it certainly was never the plan of, of council members. Um, it's essential for you to have a good relationship, find out who these people are, get to know them. And, and not only um, not only the obvious ones, but how about the ones that maybe aren't so obvious? Uh, my relationship with the GNCC, with um, the YWCA, um, these are very, very important um, groups to, uh, to know and understand uh, where they're going. What's their agenda? How would it impact us? How can we help? Um, and then when those issues come up, you know who to go to. You've already laid the groundwork. And so it's very, very important to spend some time on those um, items. We spent a lot of time with uh, MPP Sam Roosterhoff. He has brought in a lot of money, capital money, into our community. Um, if there are problems on the horizon, we let him know. We never, ever allow him to be in a position where he's having to answer a question on a municipal matter that we haven't already advised him on. Uh, the same with our MP, and we don't, I don't care what your stripes are. We talk to Vance Spadaway just as much as we talk to Dean Allison. You know, sometimes it's convenient to talk to the government in power. Sometimes you want information to be flowing a little bit differently. Senator um, Peter Harder is from Vineland. Um, and um, we use Senator Harder a great deal if we want to get messages through to the federal government. So, you know, you can go on and on because there's just so many ways 
to skin that cat, how to get to know people, how to have those conversations. They're always enjoyable, they're always enlightening. And to me, it is time well spent. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Uh, Sandra, what is, what's your perspective on this? Um, well, um, I think that Mayor Easton uh, uh, was able to offer more because I'm relatively new. I came in in midterm even, and, and at a time when the pandemic was there. So I didn't even get to meet with my fellow uh, council uh, members for for quite some time, at least in the capacity of being a, uh, a counselor. So I think the pandemic and meetings online and everything has really impacted uh, relationship building. That being said, I, I uh, was, knew our MPP from dealing with um, health services issue uh, prior to, to the pandemic. I knew our MP because I was on the campaign trail with them. Like you said, Mayor Easton said, doesn't matter your stripes, you, you get to know these people. I also think from a perspective of a counselor versus a mayor is that you, your municipality has to talk with one united voice. So it has to go through through the mayor, uh, you may be representing the mayor, you know, if asked upon to do, to do that. But you, in my opinion, you can't go off on your own tangent and your own voice. You have to sing as one voice to make any improvements. And it is important to, um, to uh, establish our relationships with these uh, decision makers. It's important, particularly if you want to develop, I don't know, a new swimming pool or, you know, a health center or, or, or whatever you need the support. But the other thing is, it's also important to develop a relationship with the regional councillors. Like I know the mayors are on the regional council, but each municipality has at least one additional regional council. And there may be issues that on one of the standing committees that uh, you want to, uh, there are an issue that there's an issue from your municipality and you want to establish a relationship with some of the um, regional councils who are on that standing committee. So relationship building is, is very important, but for the last two years has been difficult because of the pandemic. That's my bottom line. Thank you. Thank you both um, for those insights and really, Nonpartisanship is very important and um, and just really developing really strong relationships with those who share all the interests within your your area is very important. So thank you for that. I think we're going to try to get to some of our participant questions. Um, so the first one, I know that I had a question. Um, Sarah actually asked about the role of the school trustee and the experience and amount of time required for that position. Um, Mayor Easton, could you possibly give some insights as far as that's concerned? I'm very sorry. I, I certainly do know Elizabeth Cross and she is our, our trustee in this area, but I, I don't know uh, what the, the workload is, uh, is like at all. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Sandra, uh, do you have any insights at all about that role? No, not from workload, but I do think that there is somewhat of a disconnect between the school boards and the municipalities, and I think it would be good uh, in the future to try and develop better relationship or closer relationships between the two um, types of governing bodies. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Sarah, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to your school board trustee for your area. Simply ask that question. I'm sure they would love to give you some insights in relation to what their day looks like, uh, the level of responsibility and the time commitments. Um, I'm sure they wouldn't mind sharing that with you. At least I hope so. Um, we have another question from Sharmila. Uh, how should you campaign when you don't have name recognition? Or you might be challenged about the length of time that you've lived in the community? Mayor Easton, I'll start with you and then I'll go to, Sa to Sandra. Thank you very much uh, for that question. It's true, um, you do need to begin to uh, develop a, a base of information. And as Sandra O'Connor has already said, and she's going to answer this better than I can, um, but you, you have to become, you, you have, you, then you have to build your own name rec recognition, but you probably already have qualities that you're going to stand on maybe more than your name. And so look at the issues that are in your community, 
match them up with the qualities that you have and start building your portfolio around a few of those issues. Take those issues to other people that you get to know in the community, find out how valid they are. And you'll start to soon find out um, where that you have more, greater strengths than, uh, than you uh, actually expected. Absolutely, thank you, Sandra. Uh, yes, I had absolutely no name recognition here. And as Mayor Easton said, I had to build it myself. I started by, um, even though you want to be on council and help the community, there are certain sort of niche areas that capture your heart, okay? So the first one I started to, to build upon was when they closed our hospital or in the process of closing our hospital. And I, I tried to lead the charge to, um, to keep our hospital open. I was not successful, but I started to build a name rec uh, recognition there. The other one, as I already mentioned, is the environment, excuse me. So all of the goings on with the M MPCA, again, that was something I got involved with. And when I say get involved with, it also means writing letters to the editors, um, making presentations at community associations, um, uh, things like that. And, and, and one step more into the environment is um, uh, we, we established the first urban tree bylaw on private property in Niagara. And I spearheaded that, uh, the push towards it, the, the council actually uh, uh, put it in place, but uh, that was my, one of my goals that I was pushing for and I got name recogni recognition there. So build your own name recognition through taking an issue and running with it and getting it in the paper and letters to the editor. The other thing is build on your strengths. Uh, what I had, as I said, no name recognition here. Uh, O'Connor's my married name, but my grandparents owned a farm uh, in the Niagara and the Lake where my uh, father was raised and he fought for the, this regiment and everything. So when I was actually campaigning for council, I would try and work that in so that people know that I do have my roots here and that I am concerned about this community. So take whatever strengths you have and try and build on that. Absolutely, thank you both. Um, I think, uh, you know, what you've uh, provided as insights are very helpful. I can say someone who, as a, in addition to being a, the citizenship judge for Hamilton Niagara, I am also a professor at Mohawk and at Queens Law School. And the thing that I say to my students is you find the thing that resonates with you. You find the issues that resonate with you so that you can walk with integrity and be engaged with integrity. And that totally comes across now when you're now interacting with your community and that name then built you. So thank you both for those insights. Um, the final question, uh, don't worry, Helen, I didn't forget about you. Uh, Sandra, both Sandras, how do you handle social media? Many women are intimidated by keyboard warriors. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Starting with you, Mary Easton. Well, I think the first rule, and it's a really important one, is that just because someone's trying to engage with you, if you're not comfortable, then you shouldn't be engaging back until you uh, get some advice. Because once it's on there, once you've engaged, um, you, um, you, you, know, you can start going down different roads that uh, you just don't want to be going down. Furthermore, you don't even know who the person is on the other end. You have no idea what their motivation is for being there. So. There are people, um, there's generally uh, someone on staff that has expertise in this area. Some municipalities offer, or this is part of the orientation. Dealing with the media, dealing with social media is a very, it's an extremely important part of who we are and how we uh, come across to the public. But I really caution you, don't worry about doing too much too quickly because it's very difficult to, um, to, to address any um, you know situations that you that were totally unintentional. Absolutely, thank you. It can be quite, it can be quite fun sometimes, but um, you you do need to um, you need to be comfortable. Absolutely, I always say to my students and my kids to remember that you're always on stage as well, um, and you were on stage before you engaged in community or municipal or you know any of the work that you're doing. But just always remember that you're on stage. 
And final word goes to you, Sandra O'Connor. Uh, how do you deal with uh, social media and how do you handle keyboard warriors? Um, thank you. Um, I just, I agree with Mayor Easton uh, personally. I do not get involved with any social media that isn't my social media. For instance, there's a lot of uh, Facebook um, sites uh, uh, around Niagara and there are many things that are said about what council is doing or not doing or whatever. And I, I see in it whether there's all these errors, they don't have the facts right. And I just, I want to jump in there and say, well, these are the facts, but I hold myself back. I don't get engaged. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. So um, uh, I think that that is important for people to, to do, uh, not get engaged. With regards to my own social media, I only have a Facebook site for when it's election time. Apart from that, I do not have one because again, I don't want to get into that situation. Uh, I think I, I have been fortunate since I've only had half a term uh, that I haven't got any through my public um, um, council emails or anything. So I haven't really been um, uh, faced with that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for your insights. Social media has become a very important um, aspect of the way that we communicate with our constituents and also the way that we interact just generally with the world. And so I think that those insights are helpful um, and that people can take with them. I want to thank the both of you before I uh, uh, pass this on to Grace, Councillor O'Connor, Mayor Easton for your time, for your uh, insightful words um, and uh, just for, um, all of the information that you've been able to um, elicit to our participants today. Thank you both, sincerely, thank you. Uh, Grace, it's your turn. <laughs> thank you so much. What a great conversation. Uh, Mayor Easton, Sandra O'Connor, Councillor Sandra O'Connor. Uh, thank you so much to Bev Bradman. And of course, Cassie, uh, it is so wonderful to have this conversation this evening. Um, and thank you, of course, to everybody who's attended tonight. We have launched, uh, you'll see it pop up on your screen. There's a follow-up poll. Um, and you'll see that the questions are the same from the start. Uh, we will be sending out a short evaluation of this session. Um, as well, we will send out more information uh, with the link for the next session. Um, this survey will also ask if you are interested in participating in a short mentorship program. Um, I did see some people looking for that information in the chat. So if you are interested in participating, uh, we will be pairing women and gender diversity diverse individuals who are thinking of running with an experienced female counselor. Um, and you'll be able to uh, have the opportunity to ask some questions, uh, specific questions, of course, anything you're looking to have an understanding of uh, before deciding to run. And so if you are interested in having um, these sessions. Um, they'll be approximately one to two hours each with the current counselor. So please include your name and email address in the chat box, uh, or again, complete the survey, uh, which has been posted and uh, there will also be one again sent out. So uh, the next session will be held on Wednesday, June 29th at 6 p.m. And this session will focus on addressing potential scrutiny, bias, uh, discrimination that you could face while campaigning or uh, as a person in office and how we can best prepare for it and, and how you can respond. So uh, again, thank you so much to everybody this evening. Um, we hope this was so informative. It was so informative for me, I'm sure, as a local Lincolner. So uh, Mayor Easton, it was so great to have your perspective and uh, everybody just thank you so much. We're looking forward to the next session. Wishing you all a great night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone.